Hello and welcome to Cambridge and Gonville and Keys College. We're at the Stephen Hawking building. So with the group we've got here today, which you might call a kind of constitutional focus group, we'll be asking about the role of government. So let's turn now to the debate. <laughs> now let's start with something which you hear a lot of, but I find rather confusing. Uh, does the government have too much power or too little? One minute it's too much, surveillance, security, counter-terrorism laws, big brother. The next minute it's too little. European Union, international organisations, multinational corporations. Chamali Fernando, barrister from uh, graduate of UCL, I think, not yes, Cambridge University, right. but we let you in. <laughs> uh, and more to the point, a prospective parliamentary candidate or parliamentary candidate for the Conservative Party here in Cambridge. That's right. Uh, Government, too much power, too little power, is it just about right? I think it's right. We have uh, an unwritten constitution in this country and we have the separation of powers. So you've got the executive, the judiciary and the legislature, mm -hmm. which ensure that there is this system of checks and balances on each on the other. So whether you're talking about surveillance laws, even if you increase the capacity of uh, institutions to put people under surveillance, they still have to go to a judge and get the authority to put someone under surveillance who they suspect yeah, so of a crime. So there is that checks and balance, checks and balance all the always, time. Because your party's in government, doesn't the party in government always say it's just right? And then when they lose an election, they say, oh, too much power. Do you think Daniel Zeichner, who is from Unison and the uh, parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party, I imagine you're going to tell me government has too much power, are you? No, I'm not actually. Um, my party, in my view, is that government is generally a force for good in society. But I think the question is the relationship between central government and local government and the European Union. And I think Britain has been over-centralised for far too long, which is why my party wants to devolve power down to regions like Cambridge. But I also think that within the European Union we have to be engaged and make sure that we actually exercise power. And I think just in the last few weeks we've seen that actually Britain's influence <coughs> in the European Union is ever diminishing under the current government. And I think we need to be back at the heart of Europe. But your slogan is more power for Cambridge. Absolutely. Oh, Always it's surprising you're Cambridge. running for a seat here. Well, because Cambridge, of course, is one of the most dynamic drivers of the all economy. All right, all right. We know all that and publicity. A, and, and in a two-tier local government system where we're run by people from March and Wisbeach, we do not have the power we need to get the maximum from it for Cambridge and for the wider economy. We need to give Shamali a right of reply on well, that on, uh, on naked <laughs> political intervention. <laughs> on, that, on that point of how much power we actually have in Cambridge, do we really need another layer of bureaucracy? Do we ne really need a regional government? Uh, I don't think we do. And actually, we have, we have problems in Cambridge that we can't tackle with our own existing local authority. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, Coleridge, one of the wards in Cambridge. In the park there, there is dog mess, and people want that cleaned. Uh, you wouldn't put that in the Constitution, actually, would no, you? There's nothing the to do with the dog mess. It's, it's, no, the, the issue is, do we need extra power in Cambridge to deal with the problems of Cambridge? And actually, we don't. No. We have more than 30 councillors. Council. What, what are they doing? Yeah. Yeah. We need you one know, council, that's and that's, no. what the, that's what the business community, that's what the university will tell you, instead of having two-tier local government, we need one council. Mm -hmm. If we're going to talk about reforming the constitution, we need to be radical. We need to talk about the role of an MP in society. Right, right. And we need, to, we need to look at how many MPs we actually need. Take Britain as a country. We have 652 MPs for a population of 60 million. India, the largest democracy in the world, 1.2 billion people, has 543 MPs. Well, that's a good one. I want to come back to that because maybe I've got the idea we should abolish this seat for Cambridge and merge it into about five other seats. So there may be people who suffer. But let's hear what the, the guys here think about, you know, I mean, in, we, we haven't got you, Kip, because they're busy working in Europe. Today. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> busy working in Europe. Working, I assume, to dismantle Europe or their constituency wouldn't be that happy. And the Lib Dem guy is over there in Parliament working. So there's reasons why we've got the Labour and the Conservative candidates. Uh, we're not favouring two parties in particular. What do the people think about this interaction between Conservative and Labour and about power? Anybody here? There's some law students here. There's some people from Huntington here. I was wondering, when you said, um, when you mentioned the, the checks and balances provided by the separation of powers, uh, whether you think that still holds true with all the legal aid cuts that are recently... Uh, being enacted and further ones still being proposed. Right, that's interesting. Are you suggesting that the Constitution 
depends on legal support for cases in order to make it work. Is that the kind of point you're making? Sort of, yeah. I think that um, judicial review and judicial intervention in securing the fundamental rights at the basis of the Constitution is key. It's, it's hard to say whether there is too much power in the abstract. Uh, we need to look at specific issues of concern as they arise inter alia through the, the perspective of the judges yeah. in cases of judicial right. review. And if we don't have that, we can't really know. We won't be able to have judicial scrutiny on such individualized instances. Right, okay. Nice use of inter alia conversation there. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. My compliments to the Cambridge faculty for inculcating, <laughs> for inculcating such excellent Latin. Is there anybody, we'll come back to you obviously, but is there anybody else who wants to comment on this issue of of power, are you going to com com comment on this? Well, sort of. Are you a law student in Tirelli and the others? I am in Tirelli with the with the other law students. A fortiori, you must have a very good point of view. <laughs> <laughs> we better stop all this Latin guys. We're going to junk this whole thing. Okay. And the idea of legal aid is key in making sure that the government sticks to its power. So it's not necessarily about the fact that it has too much power or too little. It might have just the right amount of power, but it, that makes legal aid cuts very easy and very easy for budget deficit reductions and things like that. But that means that in reality, the executive can effectively override the separation of powers through all three branches of government. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real problem. Okay, very interesting. There's some points that we want to pick up and we do want to come back to you guys, but is there any comments here? We'll take you, sir, and then we'll come into Helen, actually. Yes? On one point about the legal aid, I was a legal aid lawyer. That's a merit test. If there's justification, you get legal aid. What this fuss is all about. Legal aid could be a gravy train as well. I think some people are saying to the, uh, mislead the people, public, that there is no legal aid. Legal aid is there where there should be. There's nothing to worry about the legal aid. Thank you, thank you. I want to introduce Helen, Helen Hoogver McComb. You are president of the Cambridge Students' Union yeah. and have worked in the welfare field and was at Newnham, I think, yeah. isn't that right? right? You wanted to come in uh, on, on the point you've heard so far and on power as well. Yeah. So I, just on the, on the general topic of power, I think when we're talking about constitution, um, it shouldn't necessarily be about how much government has, but how a constitution balances power in society. Um, and that means that you should be trying to empower individual citizens um, and that the power of the government should be there to protect the rights uh, of, of those citizens and to empower them. Um, I think what we see at the moment is that we have some areas where the government can overreach what we would see as desirable power, um, particularly with surveillance. Um, we see a lot of times where business exerts far more power than individual citizens and that's something that you would seek to address. Um, the influence that business has on government versus the individual citizen is, is really significant and is something that, that should be addressed. And when you're looking at different models of representation and different models of government and different models of, of how you structure political parties and donations, I think that's really key. Right. right. We, we want to distinguish between uh, the particular and the general. Because what I want you to imagine is your complete creative capacity to design something that works afresh. That's what we're doing. That's the input we want. If you're designing a constitution, to deal with the problem of the misuse of power, there's things you can do. One, you can actually follow the Americans and lots of other places, and you can take the executive, which is the government, the cabinet, out of parliament and locate it somewhere else. Separation of powers. Historically, we don't have it because the queen is notionally the head of the executive. That's one thing you could do. Another thing you could do, listening to what Helen was saying, is you could have controls on money. For example, take our two candidates, there would be a strong prohibition on, for the sake of argument, labour support from the unions and a strong support from, uh, on banning big business support for the Conservatives. That's another thing we could do. Or we could have a judicially enforced Bill of Rights that would protect everybody and police the boundaries. Do any of those appeal in particular, Shumati, on this general point, and then I'll come to you, Daniel. Well, you've, you've covered a raft of points. I have, I, intentionally. I, <laughs> I want to come to a point that's not really been mentioned, which is where the system of checks and balances kicks in. Yeah. It, the constitution of this country is underpinned by the doctrine of the rule of law, the concept that no one should be above the law. And therefore, whether that be uh, a member of the government, take, for example, the case of David Laws. He's the former minister who defrauded the taxpayer by £40,000. He was able to resign from his job as a minister, but he kept his parliamentary seat. Right. Anyone in this room, you and I, go and steal a Kit Kat, which is worth 40 pence from a news agent, and the police will be on to us, and we've, we face the risk of running a prosecution. I would like to see the power to say, right, if you've done, 
if you've done something wrong, you should face a prosecution, whoever you are, at whatever no, level. A lot of them went to jail. Do you agree on this one? I think on this I rather agree that David Laws shouldn't be in the, in, the cab in the government at the moment, but that's a matter for David Cameron and Nick Clegg. Um, in terms of power in general, I have to say this, this feels a long way from the things that I hear from the people I talk to on the doorstep. And most people don't understand the fine distinctions yeah. between Parliament, government and these constitutional yeah. issues. The questions for them are the day-to-day -day bread and butter things like does the National Health Service work? And when you look at accountability in that, and you ask yourself how, for instance, our local health service is accountable, nominally up through Parliament and back down again, that seems like a very curious route to most people. Yeah. So when yeah. we have a local hospital under pressure, like Hinchinbrook, for instance, people say, well, who made that decision? And how is it to be done? Yeah, and, and that's I a private hospital that's closing or is handing the stock back, isn't it? Precisely. Yeah. And we have not been very good, I would suggest, in designing a political system that makes people feel that they've got some power. What about another, of, I think it's Helen's idea, but another of these ideas, you didn't quite say it, but put it like this, a constitutional ban on corporate support, which includes trade unions, for political parties. Though you can obviously have tension between corporations donating to political parties and things like that, I think a lot of the money spent on political parties is spent during sort of general elections and, uh, and educating the public about, admittedly partisanly, about party politics. But it's a really important factor in terms of the education of the population. And like, I have friends at other universities who have no idea how politics works, have mm. no idea how the constitution or anything like that works. So as much as there can be tensions, I think there maybe should be rules, but a ban on donations just cuts away that funding and that just means that you're not educating the public about the way that their countries run. Right, I see what you mean. So it's yeah. a quick fix. It yeah. looks dramatic but does nothing. Would that be your position? My position is this. We have the beauty of an unwritten and very flexible yet evolving constitution. Yeah, I thought you were a fan of it. <laughs> I thought you were a fan of it. Well, Until you're not lose power. No, no, not at all. We, uh, that we have taken the mindset that generally the system in Britain works where it falls apart is individual cases like the one I mentioned earlier. And we've also heard earlier about access to justice. Now, those are things that can be enshrined in a British Bill of Rights, for example. At the moment, we have the European Convention on Human Rights, which guarantees certain fundamental rights for the people of this country and the people of Europe. But we, we know we have an established legal system that we can actually bring in a better set of rights that is more appropriate to the people of this country under a British Bill of Rights. Right. So, so we need to take a bit more control. It's money and rights. I want to get on to Danny, but I want to ask you a very specific question. It's a yes or no answer. Go on. It's a yes or no answer. I'm listening. Yeah. You've got the Bill of Rights, you've won, you've got rid of this human rights thing, you've got the Bill of Rights. A person who is uh, illegally here has got a life-threatening illness, turns up at one of your hospitals, and says, I've got a right to health because the Conservatives have enacted the Bill of Rights. Is the Bill of Rights for everybody or is the Bill of Rights just for Britons? Would somebody who's unlawfully here get treated? Yes or no? You're looking at the Hippocratic Oath. So I'm not, yes. I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Hippocratic Oath. Did you say oath. you're looking at a hypocritical party? <laughs> I missed that. The Hippocratic Oath is the right that a doctor will treat someone who has a uh, a okay. life-threatening illness. So that's a, another fundamental right, that is okay. also a custom of so our I, medical I profession. I take it as the answer. It wouldn't be in the Bill of Rights, but you rely on the doctor to do the decent thing. Daniel, how would you get on without the unions? Because if we ban funding by corporates, mm. we have to do it from, for example, the likes of Unison, a party to, uh, union with which you've been involved. Absolutely, and trade union funding of the Labour Party is the cleanest money in politics. It's all highly regulated. <laughs> it has to be declared. It's made up of millions of individual contributions freely given by trade union members. And the real question here is, how would you fund politics without the money that's coming in mm -hmm. from things like trade union support for the Labour Party? Now, the Conservatives, of course, would quite happily completely destroy the Labour Party's funding stream, and I'd suggest to you that's a fundamental tack on democracy. Right, OK. So we're pretty relaxed as a group on no campaign limits, actually, which is quite interesting. And no, possibly a bit of advertising. That's not, at all, what, no. not at all what we're saying. Correct me then. Well, Labour. Well, not at all what you're saying. No, Labour introduced clear spending limits. Now, spending we, limits. We, we think that you can make elections much cheaper. Right. There's already, of course, public money spent on election campaigns, but politics has to be funded to make our democracy work. So you have to think this, this stuff through carefully. Yeah. But 
there were tough spending limits and regulations, and that's right. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, for the clarification as well. We'll get back to you on bills of rights presently, but I want to come over to you, sir. The biggest aspect that you see is you want to avoid, as a country, moving towards an American style of electioneering, which is consistent elections, heavily funded by super PACs or multi-millionaires, billionaires, or philanthropists who want to shape the agenda of the day. So that's one of the things that we have to bear in mind. Whatever system that comes out must take care of the fact that if you do turn the pipe off for uh, the Labour Party on unison, et cetera, and then you say to the Conservatives, you can't take money from big business or whoever, yes, there's going to be some consideration whether the taxpayer is going to step in to take that, take that yeah. responsibility. But I think given the imperfections of our system or perfections of our system, I think we're in a much better place in England than we would be if we are a voter in the United States of America. So, so it's a battle between big billionaire titans. Yes, so you, your super PACs are effectively investment banks that control the agenda of the yeah. day. I take the point on America. It's interesting how America provides so many negative examples for us and makes us very anxious, not least the Supreme Court, etc., which we haven't discussed. One thing about America, I think it was, was it you, Helen, was saying your, your friends don't understand the Constitution and so on, and they don't remember who, with respect to the two of you, who their MP is. And why we could actually, because remember, we're designing this afresh, we could actually take the executive out of Parliament, you know, and we could say, right, the people, in inverted commas, have a choice of choosing the chief executive. And then they would know. It would be a choice between Mr. Cameron, Mr. Miliband, Mr. Clegg, Mr. Farage, <laughs> Natalie Bennett and the Greens. <laughs> would that work, do you think? Helen, do you think that would work? Um, I think, again, so talking about America, I think you need to be really careful. Um, what you see in America with kind of very separate forms of elections um, is that you can have a very divided government. Um, and you just need to look now, you have the Republicans in control of both houses of Congress uh, and a Democratic president. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think that, um, that there are pros and cons to it. And that the idea of having um, majority, uh, kind of the total majority of the country able to express their representation in some way, not necessarily in a single elected leader, but for exa example, in a different um, house of parliament, mm -hmm. um, could be very attractive. Um, right. It means that you avoid things like gerrymandering in electoral districts. Yeah. Um, but it's not something that you could necessarily say is perfect in a single elected leader. Right, so a bit anxious about yeah. Helen. Would that demystify things for them, do you think? I think, I think part of the problem is, is not just about the picking the leader and picking who it is, but I think you've, the, idea, the appeal of the American system with the very separate elections is that you really do know who you're voting for. Exactly. People vote for their MP but they're not voting for their MP, they're voting for David Cameron, Nick Clegg and Miliband. And I think that's where the confusion really comes in. And there, it's not necessarily the way to go by having a separate executive and separate parliament. Mm -hmm. it's, it, there are pros and cons to both sides, but there needs to be some sort of solution. So there's not this confusion of, well, who am I voting for? Do mm -hmm. I vote for the party or the person? And even if you're voting for the person, which person are you voting for? Exactly, exactly. You like well, Miliband to be on the ballot paper and not your name? <laughs> Well, he is actually, as far as I'm concerned, uh, but we've tried this already. The Police and Crime Commission elections were yes. an attempt to, to elect an individual, and we saw what happened with that. In Hartlepool, with a directly elected mayor, the people elected a monkey, and in a directly elected mayor in London, they elected Boris I mean, Johnson. by the way, that's not defamatory. It was literally no, it was, a monkey. No, it was the monkey mascot. Yeah. Yeah. So people, we've tried the direct election approach. I don't think it works that well in Britain, quite frankly. I think people like to elect local people who they know as councillors in the same way as they like to elect local MPs who they know, and those people then make a decision yeah. in that assembly for who actually leads. Yeah, I think that might be right. There might be much appetite for true separation of powers in that way. Somali, you're a fan of s true separation of powers. One thing about this uh, system, I, I know there are some changes to be made from time to time. That's yeah. it, it happens all the time. But we have a perfect system. Why worry? Why go and bring a presidential type of uh, scenario to us at this moment? There is no need for that. Well, you're emerging as the absolute advocate of the status quo. A minute ago, of legal course. aid was all fine. Would you pull yourselves together? No, no, no. I'm now, everything is, in your word, no, perfect. No, 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 no. I, I have been on that train all the time, OK? Changes for the sake of changing? Why? What for? To improve things. To Sorry? improve things. Not everybody shares your view about well, the supreme that, perfection that's, of that's the British That's the beauty of the democracy, isn't it? That you can be outvoted. Well, that doesn't matter. Maybe, uh, you've only been listening, you don't have to say anything, except this. Would you like to see the Prime Minister as somebody like an American president 
Or are you perfectly content with the system we've got at the moment, like Somal here? I think the problem is, you know, if I may go back to I do, the question, absolutely. you know, education is where we have gone down because the lady over there said people don't know about politics. Why don't we start getting youngsters involved in politics? Teach a bit of politics, not this sex education and all these other things, important things like. Uh, uh, but well, it's not politics. either or, is it? It's not <laughs> either or. <laughs> Although, I mean, from, no. from what I gather, with all the sleaze, the politicians need to know the first in order to practice the second. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I'm old-fashioned, right? I do believe in, you know, educating people on, prop, you know, proper things rather than unnecessary things. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other comments on this? The second from the back, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, Lottie, I'd just like to reiterate that point really. I've just spent the last 12 years living in Scotland and you really can educate an entire population. I mean, mm -hmm. oh, over 90% of a population about politics, enough mm -hmm. that they can vote with an informed decision. That is something we don't have here. I was, I mean, I was dumbfounded at the ability of the Scottish Parliament to be able to educate people and get them interested about politics. That is something we don't have here. Well, that is really interesting because actually I, I draw two conclusions from that. Now, maybe they're both wrong, but I'd like you to comment on them. <laughs> One is <laughs> when you devolve power, and we're not just talking about Scotland and Wales, and remember, we're designing a constitution here. We could devolve it into regions in England as well. You bring politics close to people. That's the first mm -hmm. thing I, I think is implicit in what you say. But the second thing, referendums, when they're well designed, mm -hmm. do improve electoral understanding, especially when young people are allowed to vote. Yeah. Is that your impression? I agree. I agree that the referendum was structured, it was simple, and it allowed people to <coughs> engage clearly with something that was a yes or no. Whatever side you're on of the debate, there was ways to find out things about it, and people were genuinely educated. I mean, we struggled to get 65% voter turnout in the UK, and I mean, we're voting for some of the biggest issues on a domestic level, on a European level, on an international level. We don't understand who our MP is. We don't really understand what they do. I mean, MPs, for a start, I think, have too many different roles to play. They're either in the cabinet, they're on the streets, they've got to debate in parliament, they've got to be part of select committees, they've got to do this, that and the other. They can't do all the jobs at once. I mean, should ministers have to give up their parliamentary seat? Uh, that'd be a big one, temporarily. Uh, should we achieve this representation through regional government rather than through central government? And should we give the vote to people from 16 up as a way of rebuilding belief in politics? I don't think that uh, you need to give the vote to people from 16 upwards. The lady at the back made a very good point. Educate people in schools. We have the opportunity to educate them about the political process, how laws are made in this country. I think one of the reasons why I got involved in politics, having done a law degree, but also having studied politics before going to university, is I, I realised that actually this is a subject that pervades every aspect of our lives. You open the newspaper and it's either got an article on law or it's an article to do with politics. We have a bit of voter apathy in this country which we need to overcome. Right, but which we don't do through young people voting, which is interesting. I mean, I'm not asking you to repeat yourself. I wonder, Helen, you've come at this from a student's union. Thank you. From a student's union perspective. You deal with young people all the time. You look for their votes. Do you think 16, 17 year olds could actually cope with voting? And would it improve things if they did? I think they could. And I think the fact that we tell young people that they can't vote at the age of 16 is part of what turns them off from voting. Um, you tell them they're not educated enough, you tell them that they aren't old enough and they couldn't possibly understand these issues. And so at the point when they're most engaged with education, when they're in school, they aren't actually given an incentive to learn about the process. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you were in school during a general election or even a local election and part of your school's education duty was to teach you about how to decide who to vote for. Not to tell you who to vote for, but to teach you how to look at the issues. I think also we need to think about pretty much every democracy across the world um, has decided that you represent people based on geography that the person most qualified to represent you is the one who's been voted in in your local area. Well, if you look generationally rather than geographically, um, a lot of young people will have very similar views, but there's no way for them to unite together and vote for people who represent young people because they'll be dominated by older generations. Um, if we had a method, so for example, if we had a second house that was based on age grouping rather than geography, um, then you would have a balance that would mean that young people were represented no matter what their voter turnout was. Um, they would definitely be represented in our government systems. Mm -hmm. So think creatively in yeah. order to energise the system. Yeah. Daniel, 
on all of these issues, but particularly oh, the young people's voting and redesigning the House of Lords, the upper house. Uh, right, very quickly. I moved yes. the proposition to lower the voting age of 16 to the Labour Party conference in 1999. It's taken a long time. When he was like that, say, were you a teenager? <laughs> uh, well, I'd love to say I was a teenager then, but it that would be stretching it. But <laughs> the great news is that it's now finally in Labour's programme. If Labour wins the election in May, the voting age will come down to 16, and I think it's a really terrific idea. And all of us will be doing debates with sixth form students in Cambridge and I can tell you you get a higher quality of debate with 16, 17, 18 year olds than virtually any other group I ever come across. Mm -hmm. On House of Lords reform, that's another of my lifelong passions and I'm determined to see all those unelected people replaced by genuinely elected people. It's just outrageous that there are so many London and South East based people in the House of Lords who have such control over our lives and we don't even know who most of them are. <laughs> friend of mine, his life was saved in the House of Lords. He was making a debate, he had a heart attack. The best heart surgeon in the country was in the chamber. Said, let me through, I'm a heart surgeon, and saved his life. He's there because of his esteem, or she might be there to pick another person, a woman, might be because of their leadership in some other field. So there is a way, putting the other point of view, that the House of Lords operates to bring expertise into government. Is that a convincing argument? I think, you are right to point out the expertise, and not only the expertise, but the um, political neutrality and independence that obviously would, that would, would lack in a candidate from the House of Commons is essential going back to guaranteeing the system of checks and balances and of ensuring that um, the quality of the decisions that are made and the, the, the input from the House of Lords has both an expertise aspect mm -hmm. and a an independent aspect to it. Yeah, to yeah. So you're kind of slightly partisan towards that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, am. I am. You were nodding vigorously to me when he was talking about reforming the House of Lords. No, now I, I think you're I, going to defend it. I'm in favour of reforming the House of Lords. The House of Lords at the best of times... Bringing is, is young people, as we heard here from Helen? One moment. The House of Lords at the best of times is a combination of uh, a radical think tank, then at times it's a dormitory, and times it's an empty living room. So it doesn't function in the way that we would like it to. It's embarrassing when you see members of the House of Lords, if you watch the BBC Parliament channel, who are asleep. Those are people we've put They're in charge. They're concentrating. Concentrating with our eyes shut. With the, the, the top people, <laughs> top people don't use up space in their brain looking at things. <laughs> we, could, we, could, we could try and fool some of the people, but we're not going to be able to fool them all the time. And I think... If we're talking about constitutional reform, we need to look at the role of the upper chamber. And it shouldn't just be a place where you come, you, you register in, and then you can go off and have your lunch. There should be proper debates in there. And don't get me wrong, there are some fantastic yeah. people in the House of Lords who really perform checks and balances on the government of the day and, the, and on the House of Commons and scrutinise legislation. That's what they're there for. Right. And right. add an amend to legislation yeah. for but, a second. But you know you don't even need it. You know, New Zealand got rid of it completely. So we, we might just junk it. You know, we might just junk it. We, we need to think really radically to see whether we can design something more exciting. Uh, one thing occurs to me, gender, gender. It's an extraordinary thing how few women there are in government at the moment and in the cabinet at the moment. And uh, I wondered about this. What about a constitutional, a constitutional requirement of diversity from the top down? Helen, what about this? Would this work, do you think? 50%, 40% should be uh, women. In, in government? So I tend to think, and this is based, I mean, our student union has a constitution. I've worked way too long rewriting bits of it recently. Oh, you're, um, re you're <laughs> writing another constitution <laughs> in your spare much, time. Much less important. Um, but I mean, the principle of writing constitution is you, you, you don't write for the problems you have now. You yes. write for, this, like, for the creation that you wish to be there in the future. Um, and while maybe it might be appropriate to look at how, how quotas could be used on all kinds of diversity issues um, in government, I don't think that's a constitutional issue. I think that's a matter for legislation and a matter right. for Parliament to agree. OK, so you'd fight for it, but you wouldn't say we're going to have it forever. That's very interesting. Would anybody vote for that? Would anybody push that in the Constitution? Would you? I think that that's part of the argument that you can make for the House of Lords being appointed. I think that yeah. having more in sort of constraints in terms of who is appointed because obviously that's very much under the thumb of the prime minister as well and is appointed well they the share House it out but yeah but and but it's improved recently that yes but you could have legislation to require things yeah. like that and to require the diversity 
in the upper house. So I don't hear any there are, real there are hunger for that. There are democratically um, there are democratic ways of achieving the same thing. If you look, for instance, at the elections of the European Parliament that we now have in this country, you have a list system, and the Labour Party is quite clear. Half the members of that list will, will be women. So we've achieved the gender balance. You can do it without having to institutionalise it within the constitution. But we haven't uh, achieved the gender balance. Yeah. No, but we haven't. Yeah. We have. <laughs> no, we, we yeah. have. If you look at the Labour members of the European Parliament, it's gender balance. In now, fairness, other, he's if, talking about a particular party, which yeah, also the, has if, all if the, female shortlists. Yeah. If the other parties adopted the same approach, you would have a gender balance. Now we would do exactly the same with our elections to second chamber. So the Labour representatives to the second chamber will be gender balanced. Maria. I, I think this gender imbalance could be dealt with more generally by um, dealing with the political apathy in this country. Yeah. If you had more, uh, especially if you encouraged more um, uh, young people to, to take a greater role in, in politics, then, then you'd have this solved as this would just trickle down eventually yeah. and yeah. encourage more people to So that's the way to, to do it. Do you politics. agree with that? And then we're coming to you. I think there, there are three aspects to this. One is diversity, yeah. one is gender equality, and then the other major element, I think, is meritocracy. Because mm -hmm. if you get into the business of then saying, well, okay, this, has, this is how it has to be, I think it's disingenuous to both uh, males and females saying, well, okay, if you're not a woman, well, you can't be on this because we've exceeded our quota. If you're a man, well, you're in the, in the advantage because we haven't exceeded our quota. Yeah. So I think that's for, for the general public, they'll be like, well, okay, where does this one go? Are you saying that it's a one-in-one -one relationship or two to one? I think that's really the bit that's very unclear for people. Yeah, yeah. right. On the topic of meritocracy yes. and who we elect to parliament and who goes into the House of Lords, it really ought to be the best person. But it's, it's a little bit like the informed uh, democratic right that you have in a referendum. Let's make sure that we involve all the people in this process. Yeah. And let's make sure that they know that this is an option for them. There aren't barriers. Yeah. And sometimes you do that by creating role models in society. So someone like Karen Brady has a broader appeal than other members of the House of Lords. Um, or take Stephen Lawrence's mum, uh, yeah. an another person who reaches out to a different Right, but you'd find it very hard community. to find anybody in the cabinet to point to because they tend to resign not least Baroness Borsi. So who can you look at in the cabinet and say, there is a powerful woman who will energize Theresa young May women? Theresa May is a classic example. Theresa May, and good I, answer. I you feel, do have a home secretary. Yeah, and I, and I, Theresa Villiers, maybe, a law, yes, a law teacher there before are, she went you know, Nikki Moore, we've got women in the yeah. cabinet. Yeah. Making political parties take things seriously might say, for example, mean, what about this, that the Constitution says, that manifestos are legally binding documents. What about that? Would that, imp would that impress you? Are we going to go as far as a power of recall? Mm -hmm. Are we going to then turn around and say we want another set of elections or the government's being disingenuous? Okay. It's not upholding its uh, constitutional commitment. I think that for people would be an even bigger headache, which on, on the, again, on the doorstep, what is important to me as a voter, irrespective of my political persuasions is, if I see something being done, is it being done in my interest or the interest of a specific group of people? Right, right. And, and I feel passionately as a human being that if we get into the business of, okay, we've legally bonded um, the government of the day into a specific number of actions, and if it doesn't do that, I think the mechanism then to vote them out becomes complex because yeah, right. you're going to have to wait for five years and then it's going to be, well, in the last three years or the last two years they did something good, we've forgotten what they did badly earlier or yeah. did we forget? And also, I suppose, the thing might be too inflexible if we hold them to things yeah. that they promised before they entered power. What do you think? <coughs> I agree. I think that if you make uh, make them legally binding, then the whole idea is that times change and society yeah. changes and it lacks a degree of pragmatism, which is why I think an unwritten constitution is a good thing in yeah. general. You need a degree of pragmatism. Um, and then also you get like, there's an encro encroachment by the court and the political uh -huh. sphere, which is a massive problem again. So yeah. I just don't think that's the best way so, to go so about for things. So for the same reason, just to hold on to the mic, for the same reason we wouldn't punish people for lying in parliament, because sometimes politicians have to move with the times and it means they have to change their minds and therefore it looks like a lie, but what is a lie to us is good sense to them. Well, I don't think the best way to deal with a lie as such is <coughs> to go through the courts. I think what yeah. it requires yeah. is a better degree of accountability between Parliament and the executive and government itself. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to work and develop the work of the select committees and you need to keep going with that to make sure there's 
political scrutiny rather than maybe giving it in the job of the courts. And then that would re like restore public confidence at the same time. And that is better as a political issue rather than a legal Yeah, one. very interesting that, very interesting. It's a very interesting legal issue is the, uh, we, the letters that were sent to escaping prisoners mm. in, in Northern Ireland. We promise not to arrest you. And you just think, what's going on there? Well, as the former Prime Minister Tony Blair said, what's going on there is playing with the law in order to get peace. Mm. John Major, a previous Prime Minister, said, I will never talk to the IRA. Mm. He was talking to the IRA. Mm. He couldn't tell people at mm. the time. So it's interesting how sometimes, exactly what you're saying, getting the law in can cause more trouble than it's worth. We're coming to the end. I want you to spend 10 seconds on if you had one constitutional change that we empowered you to put into our people's constitution, what would it be? Daniel. Decentralised power down to regions and cities like Cambridge. Thank you. Do you want? I want to see a reduction in the number of MPs. Reduction in the number of MPs. Lottie, increase in the number <laughs> of MPs. Exactly Go on. An increased number of representatives so that um, our representatives can actually focus on the job that they're doing rather than trying to juggle Okay, that's, many that's an argument for and not just it, but very good, very good. Helen, what would you do? A reformed uh, House of Lords or a reformed Second House um, that would make more people included in our democracy. Very good. Around the room, very quickly, yes. Abolition of the House of Lords. Thank you. Do you have one? Yes, I agree with that lady entirely, is to increase the number of um, representatives for ordinary people like us, rather than whether it's MP or Prime Minister. I often feel they're out of reach. You haven't said a thing. Now's your time to make your inaugural <laughs> intervention. What about you, madam? Um, to um, uh, like expand edu education uh, of political questions in the schools. I think it is essential that young people will be involved in the political process. And um, I mean, that's what we want. We want people in the government who represent us and how can we be represented if we don't even understand what, what they want to implement. So the one change that would achieve that is? Education. Thank you. And our Helen and Maria, what about you guys? The courts to have strike down power on unconstitutional legislation. Oh, you're well educated in Cambridge. <laughs> Propaganda for the courts. <laughs> I would say um, a greater duty to give reasons on most or all politicians. Thank you all very much for coming. As we've seen different points of view, arguments over each of the issues, we need the people ultimately to decide. But I'm very grateful to you for having made your contribution here in Cambridge today.